Good afternoon and welcome to Seeking Truth. Today we are studying Romans chapters 5 through 8. Before we start, I want to tell you a technique that Paul uses that might help you as we study Romans. He uses diatribe. What is diatribe? It's a Greco-Roman rhetorical device by which the speaker engages in a dialogue with an imaginary opponent. Have you noticed this as you're reading Paul? This device was popular among cynic and stoic masters of rhetoric and philosophers at the time. So Paul's using this technique in his writing. That's why it's confusing sometimes. It's like there's two empty chairs and Paul is engaged in a dialogue with an imaginary person. So it helps me to read Paul out loud a lot of times. When I'm having trouble understanding, I read it out loud. This one from chapter 3 is like Paul is dialoguing with an imaginary teacher. And the teacher would be one of those Jewish Christians who's been exiled for six years because of the edict of Claudius, but now he's come back. And Paul's having an imaginary conversation with him. And this was an oral culture, so sometimes it might have been two people reading the letter orally, and it would have gone something like this. Paul would say, then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? The other person would say, much, in every way, for in the first place, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. And Paul would say, what if some were unfaithful? Would their faithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? And the other person would say, by no means. Although everyone is a liar, let God be proved true, as it is written, so that you may be justified in your words and prevail in your judging. And Paul would say, but if our injustice serves to conform to the justice of God, what should we say? That God is unjust to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. The teacher says, by no means. For then how could God judge the world? And Paul says, but if through my falsehood, God's truthfulness abounds to his glory, why am I being condemned as a sinner? And why not say, as some people slander us by saying that we say, let us do evil so that good may come. The other person says, their condemnation is deserved. So do you see what Paul's doing? That's all his writing, but it's like a diatribe. It's two people talking, and he'll use Old Testament scripture references to climax this debate, and then he'll dive into his teaching, and it'll be a longer speech by just him. That's a literary technique, especially good for oral presentation called the diatribe. It's a dramatic discourse mimicking the to and fro of a debate or conversation, although slipping where necessary into a more extended, expanded speech by one or the other party. So I just want you to be aware that Paul does this all throughout the letter of Romans because you can't take Paul out of context because you might just get the other empty chair. You pull a line out here, you pull a line out there, and it's half the conversation, and it's half of a debate. See how that could be really, really dangerous? <laughs> so we read the Bible in context, the whole Bible in a canonical approach. It's good to read St. Paul out loud also, so you don't get it out of context. This is a reason Paul can be misread. Let's look now at Romans 5 to 8. We've seen last week in 1 to 4 that Paul's laying out this beautiful theology, one of his best books. And in the first part, there were bad news and good news. And Paul gives the bad news first. Let's hear the bad first, get it out of the way. So he started with the wrath of God, followed by the judgment of God. And today, we get to start with some good news. Results of justification. That's a courtroom term. You have been justified. You have been made right with the judge. You've been forgiven. You've been exonerated. You've been set free. Those justified by faith are endowed with theological virtues. What are theological virtues? You know the top three. Faith, hope, and love. Paul's going to use them all in this first five verses of Romans 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope, there's the second one, of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings. We boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Don't you love suffering? And endurance produces character. A lot of good character out here. And character produces hope. 
And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Wow. Faith, hope, and love. We're justified by faith. And because of that, we can have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's always through Christ. What is this peace? What is this peace that we get? We're justified by faith, and then we get peace, peace with God. Faith leads to peace, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's always through him, with him, and in him. The hymn is Jesus Christ. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. This is going to run through this whole theme of Romans, through him, with him, in him. Everything's through Jesus. We have peace through Jesus. It's not like the world's peace, just like last week. It was not like the world's comfort. True comfort comes when iniquity is pardoned, remember? True peace comes through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not the world's peace. Jesus said to his disciples when it was getting towards the end, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's what Paul told the Philippians. This is a different kind of peace. This is shalom peace. And shalom peace in the Hebrew is being in right relationship, being righteous before God, being in right covenant with God. That's when true peace comes. The priest says it at Mass. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin. We have peace when we are free from sin because then we don't have anxiety. We're not trying to hide anything. Protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. So Jesus defeated sin and death by his cross and resurrection. The cross defeated sin, the resurrection defeated death. Lord, by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. You are the savior of the world. We say it again in the Eucharistic prayer. He frees us from sin by his cross that crushed the head of Satan. He frees us from death by his resurrection. He has eternal life and so will we through him. But our battle with sin and death is not over yet. We're not there yet. That's why we have hope. We have hope. We have hope that we're going to get there, but we're not there yet. But it's always through our Lord Jesus Christ that we can get there. We have access. We have a way back through him, with him, in him. We have to go through him. We have to live with him and in him to get back there. Jesus said to the disciples, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's the only way. He's the only way back home to the Father. He's the only one who made access. He did it. He opened the door to heaven. Jesus came down, became incarnate flesh, joined with our sinful humanity. He didn't sin, but he joined us in solidarity to our humanity so we could go back up. He's the only way. He's the only one who's done that. Jesus made access to the Father through him, with him, in him. He, Jesus, made the way back to the Father. No one else made the way back home for us. No one. It's his exclusive claim. He is the way, the truth, the life. He is the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access, through grace, he opened the gates of heaven. He made a ladder back to the Father. We were banished, children of Eve, but we have a way home now to the eternal hope once again, to see God face to face once again in a new eternal garden of Eden called heaven, paradise, the beatific vision where we will be in him fully. Jesus opened the gates of heaven. 
And through Jesus, we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast of this hope of sharing in the glory of God. Now, the world's comfort's different, the world's peace is different, and the world's hope is different than the Lord's hope. The world has a different kind of hope. Barack Obama ran his presidential campaign on the theme of the cardinal virtue of hope. Hope for change. Hope for a better future. Hope. But the world's hope is different from the Lord's hope. Because our hope in the Lord is hope of sharing in this eternal glory of God. And not only that, we also boast in our sufferings. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that he's been given to us. Wow, who is this Holy Spirit that's been given to us? This is God's sheer love. The Holy Spirit, God and Jesus are one in the same. They are so united. They are a perfection of love, and that perfection of love flows out in another person called the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, that love of the Father and Son, that perfection of love has been poured into our hearts to indwell us. Wow. They didn't have that in the Old Testament. They didn't have an indwelling Holy Spirit. They had a Holy Spirit that would anoint here and there, but not an indwelling Holy Spirit. And now faith, hope, and love abide these three. And the greatest of these is love because love is the Holy Spirit, the spirit of love, the spirit of life, the perfection of the father and son's perfect love, this outflow of perfection of love between the father and son is the Holy Spirit. And he's poured out on us. You want more of him in your life? Just ask the father. He loves to pour him out to his children who ask, who beg every day. I say, Lord, stir up your Holy Spirit in me, please. Use me today. Father, use me, use me, use me, fill me, use me, stir it up. And he does. The theological virtues are the foundation of Christian moral activity. They animate it and they give it special character. They inform and give life to all moral virtues. They are infused by God into the souls of the faithful to make them capable of acting as his children and of meriting eternal life. They are the pledge of the presence and action of the Holy Spirit in the faculties of the human being. There are three theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. That's love. You've got them all infused in you. So that's what you have through him, with him, in him. But, oh yeah, I forgot the suffering part. There's a cross involved. Because the only access back to the Father was through that cross. And he called the disciples to take up their cross and follow him. For Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Yes, you will be asked to suffer. We can't avoid the cross because the cross is going to get us home. Don't be afraid of the cross. Don't run from the cross. Embrace the cross. St. Rosa Lima, I love this quote from her. Apart from the cross, there is no other ladder by which we may get to heaven. The cross is the ladder to heaven. The cross is the letter to heaven. Jacob had a dream. Jacob, the father of Israel, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, had a dream at Bethel. He saw a ladder or a staircase come down, lined with angels. He was lying there dreaming. The ladder came from heaven to earth. Reach back up to heaven. Angels of God were ascending and descending on the ladder. The, and and, and he, he, uh, God renewed Abraham's covenant right then and there with Jacob at that spot. And when he woke up the next morning, he said, surely the Lord is in this place. I didn't know it. He was afraid. Holy, awesome fear. He said, how awesome is this place? There is none other than the house of God. This is the gateway to heaven. So Jacob rose up early in the morning, took a stone that was under his head, put it up like a pillar and poured oil. He anointed it, oil of the Holy Spirit. He called that place Bethel. Bethel means house of God. Years and years and years and years later, we would find out that that place was only 12 miles from where Christ was crucified. It's only 12 miles from the holy city of Jerusalem. 
It was the stairway to heaven. Jesus came down. Jesus will die. Jesus will rise. Jesus will ascend. Jesus will pour out his Holy Spirit all within a 12-mile radius of this ladder dream that Jacob had years and years and years and years and years and years ago. Jesus came down. Jesus went back up. There's someone that doesn't want you on that ladder home. Satan and his demons. They would like to pick you off that ladder. They would like you to fall and stumble and not make it back home. And he has a toolbox, Satan does. And it's full of tools like discouragement and condemnation. You're no good. You're worthy. You're worthless. You're lousy. You're, you think you deserve that? No, you don't. You're a sinner. He's an accuser. He's a liar. And he uses all sorts of tools and all sorts of schemes because he's clever and he's crafty and he's sly, 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 and he tries to trap you in sin. But Paul says, have endurance. Have endurance when you suffer. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint. So there's worldly endurance and there's spiritual endurance. Worldly endurance says endurance is the price tag of achievement. Spiritual endurance is like what James 1 says. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. We were studying James one year, 12 years ago. And a woman came to Bible study, and she had just lost her son. He had died, eight-year-old son. She was curled up in a ball for weeks, and a friend said, please come to this Bible study with me. And she came, and we were studying James. And that was the first thing she heard. Do you have a trial in your life? Consider it sheer joy. She slammed her Bible shut and left. She went back home, opened up the Bible again, and read it again. And the Holy Spirit just grabbed her heart, and she's come every week for the last 12 years back to Bible study. At the time, she didn't want to hear it, but she knew it was true in the depth of her soul. Psalm 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. It's easy to bless the Lord when things are going great. Husband's got a great job, just got a promotion. Oh, the kids just got a 36 on their ACT. I think it was a 37, actually. <laughs> it's easy to bless the Lord at times like that. But this psalm says, I will bless the Lord at all times. Even when I'm battling cancer. Even when I'm in the midst of a divorce. Even when my kid is... I think addicted. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will be ever in my mouth. This is powerful praise. When you praise the Lord at all times, even when it's the absolute hardest, he will honor that. There's a book called The Power of Praise by Merlin Carruthers. It's sold over 11 million copies, but it talks about the power of praise, and it's praising the Lord at times when you don't feel you can even muster up to get out of bed. Praise the Lord at all times. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rather, will anyone die for a righteous person? Though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were sinners, Jesus came. That little song when you were a kid, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. That's what this verse is saying. God proves his love for us while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He first loved us. He came while we were lousy, good-for-nothing sinners and redeemed us from the mire, from the pit. Much more surely than now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. This is the good news. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. It's through him, with him, in him. It's all through Jesus. 
in unity with the Holy Spirit for the glory of the Father. Everything is. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death came through sin, and so death spread to all because all have sinned. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23, remember? Death spread to all because all have sinned. Sin was indeed in the world before the law. But sin is not reckoned when there is no law. So Paul is saying that death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses. From the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even though those sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who is the type of the one who was to come. Sin was reigning from the time of Moses, from Adam to Moses. When did God give the law? God gave the law on Sinai in Exodus 20 to Moses. So until then, all those years they had no law. Was there any sin in the world before the time of Moses? (laughs) It only took six chapters of the Bible before God destroyed the entire earth with the flood. Only six chapters, the Lord saw the wickedness of humankind on the earth. It was so great, and every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. The Lord God was sorry that he had made mankind on the earth. It grieved him to his heart. Six chapters. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings that I have created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah, one man, found favor in the sight of the Lord. Why did Noah find favor with God? We learned about it last week with Abraham. Because of obedience. Obedience, that is faith. He obeyed the Lord. He was the laughingstock of the entire town when God told him to build an ark. And he took months and months and months and months and years and years and years to build this ark. And everyone laughed at him. But he was obedient to the Lord. Creation was already a disordered mess by Genesis chapter 6. Chaos was reigning. Death was reigning. God must recreate. What does God always use to create? always in the Bible. Water and spirit, always. What's he going to use to recreate? Water and spirit. He destroys the earth by a flood, water. God will send water, 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 40 days, 40 nights of water. Then God will send out his spirit to recreate and to renew the face of the earth. God found favor with Noah, who is righteous because he's in right relationship. He's obedient to God. And God will send a covenant sign, that rainbow, saying that humankind was back in right relationship again with God. The Spirit of God has an olive branch in his mouth. What's that symbolize? Peace. Peace. Faith leads to peace. Peace and prosperity. And God told Noah, be fruitful. Multiply. Fill the earth. I'm sorry that I had ever made them to restoring the chaos by water and spirit. God recreates, and through obedience, Noah found favor. Now, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, so death spread to all, because all have sinned. So sin became part of our spiritual DNA. You're born with it. There's nothing you can do about it. It's part of you. It's called concupiscence. What's concupiscence? The catechism tells us that as a result of original sin, human nature is weakened in its powers and subject to ignorance. Our intellects became darkened. Suffering and domination of death and inclined to sin. And this inclination is called concupiscence. The Apostle St. Paul identifies it with a rebellion of the flesh against the spirit. Concupiscence stems from the disobedience of the first sin. It unsettles man's moral faculties. And without being in itself an offense, it inclines us to commit sin. And that's why Paul has this inner conflict going on. And he says, I don't understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want to do, but I do the very things I hate. Do you ever feel that way? 
Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, but in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that nothing dwe good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do is what I do. Yeah. That's called concupiscence. <laughs> and it's a tinder for sin. And it is, um, since concupiscence is left for us to wrestle with, it cannot harm those who do not consent, but fully resist it by the grace of Jesus Christ. When you consent to concupiscence, it becomes sin. But if you don't consent, by the power of the Spirit within you, you say no. By the grace of Jesus Christ, you resist. Indeed, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Baptism confers on its recipient the grace of purification from all sins, but the baptized must continue to struggle against concupiscence of the flesh and disordered desires. We all have it. A tinder to sin. Sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned when there is no law. So, it's like this. Sin is not reckoned when there is no law. If there's a stop sign there, I got to stop. If I blow, if there's no stop sign, I can blow right through. I don't have to stop. I didn't do anything wrong. But if I fly through a stop sign, I broke the law. So I don't know what the law is unless I'm told the law. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Until that sign was put up, it wasn't a law. I didn't do anything wrong. It's like a little kid in a candy store. He's little. He's like two. And he, his mom takes him in a candy store and gives him a basket. And he's like, wow, all this candy. And he starts taking everything he, he can, you know. He has to be taught that, oh, no, we have to buy it, honey. We have to pay money. Otherwise, it's called stealing. It's a commandment. So what little kid, a lot of little kids take a piece of candy and stick it in their pocket, and their mom's driving home, and they say, Mom, look what I got. Oh, and you turn the car right around and go back. And Mr. Jones, we're very sorry that little Timmy, you know. So kids have to be taught the law. You don't know if you're breaking a law until you're taught. No transgression without knowledge of the law. That's what Paul's saying, that God gave us the law as a gift so that we could grow in holiness. He's helping us form our conscience so that we can become more like his divine image that was created in him but got tarnished and darkened through sin. Our foolish thoughts became futile. Our senseless minds became darkened. So God gave that law to Moses on Sinai, not as a punishment, but as a gift. Because God is a God of love, and he gives good things to his children. Jesus says, um, hey, what father, if the, kid, if the child asked for a fish, what dad would hand his kid a snake? Or if the kid wants an egg, what dad would hand his kid a scorpion? That's what the father is to you. He gives good gifts to his children. James says that every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the father of lights. And we know that it was the Father who gave the law. And it was a gift to instruct us how to return to holiness, how to return to the divine image we were created in. The Catechism says, according to Christian tradition, the law is holy, spiritual, and good, yet still imperfect. Like a tutor, it shows what must be done, but does not of itself give the strength, the grace of spirit to fulfill it. So you can hire a kid to help your kid take the ACT, you know, to train him, but the tutor can't take the ACT for the kid, unfortunately. <laughs> Death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses because we didn't know the rules yet. Children need to be taught. Yet, death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one to come. What is this? Typology. Paul loved typology, seeing the types. Jesus is a new Adam. The old Adam is a type of Christ. <laughs> The old Moses and the new Moses. Jesus is the new Moses. The old Adam is a type of, but the true Moses is Jesus. There's a unity in the divine plan of the two testaments through typology. The Old Testament stories, though, have a purpose of their own, and they stand on their own. But... The free gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died through the one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift of grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. 
So Paul's saying that the trespass, the sin, confined all of us. We were in bondage, but the gift is free, and it saves all of us. The freedom of grace. True freedom is in Christ, the new Adam. Much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift and the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. Jesus Christ is a type of Adam. Adam was the firstborn son of all creation. What does God always use to create? Water and spirit. In Genesis, we're told that a stream rose from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed the man out of that water and breathed the spirit of God into his nostrils. Water and spirit created man, the first Adam. What does God use to recreate? Water and spirit. The firstborn son of a new creation, Jesus Christ, comes. And he's baptized in the Jordan River by John. He submits to a water baptism, but there's a theophany where the Holy Spirit comes down. So there's spirit and water. And a new Adam takes on all the sin of mankind. He goes down, down, down into the water in a death. And he will take on all the sin of all mankind for all all time and he'll kill it he's going to kill it on the cross he's, he's going to die that that sin can be erased and then he's going to rise up out of the water as symbolic of his resurrection and john saw that spirit descend on him and remain on him and he knew that was the sign from the father water and the spirit this is the firstborn son of a new creation this is the new adam jesus christ and he told nicodemus jesus said to him very truly i tell you no one can see the kingdom of god without being born from above that means born again born from above born from heaven and Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Being born again is a recreation of all humanity. And that's baptism. And that's confirmation. It's water and the spirit in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And you get an indulgable seal and you're filled with the Holy Spirit. You were purchased at a price, a very high price, the death of Jesus Christ, so that you could die with him and rise with him in a new creation, and your sin would be erased. You're born of water and the Spirit. Catholics, are you born again? Yes, 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 a resounding yes, good. Yet, death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those sins who were not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one to come. So Jesus is this new Adam, and Jesus is a new Moses. And instead of the law on Sinai, it'll be a new law of love on the Mount of the Beatitudes. He doesn't abolish the old law, but he fulfills it through him, in him, and with him in the unity of the Holy Spirit for the glory of the Father. A new Adam, the firstborn, a new creation, and all creation. And he says in Revelation, the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. All things new. Even creation. Creation awaits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. The creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Even the earth is being recreated. Paul, John Paul uses in a general audience the scripture from Romans 8. We ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait the redemption of our body. In his letter to the Romans, St. Paul sees this redemption of the body in both an anthropological and a cosmic dimension. Creation, in fact, was subjected to futility. All visible creation, all the universe, bears the effects of man's sin. The whole creation has been groaning in travail together until now. At the same time, the whole creation awaits with eager longing the revelation of the sons of God and nourishes the hope of being freed from the slavery of corruption to obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. 
we know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we await our adoption and the redemption of our bodies. It is said that John Paul, in prayer sometimes, would just start groaning and just groan in the Spirit. All creation is groaning while we await that redemption of our body. So how are these two atoms alike? Both atoms have a bride pulled from their side while they sleep. The old Adam's bride was named Eve. She's pulled from his side while he sleeps. The new groom, Jesus, has a bride pulled from his side while he sleeps on the cross. Adam, God asked Adam to care for the garden and guard it, protect it. And after the fall, Adam became a gardener in a garden full of thorns and thistles because sin had entered the world. But Adam is a gardener. When Jesus rose from the dead, Mary Magdalene mistakes him for a gardener, the new Adam, a new gardener, a new garden. Adam's garden, Eden, became a garden of death. But Jesus' garden is a new garden. It's a resurrection garden. It's a place of eternal life. Adam's disobedience led to death. Jesus' perfect obedience to the will of the Father led to life, eternal life for all of us. Adam's children were spiritually dead because of original sin. The new Adam's children are spiritually alive. The tree of life. Jesus was there all along, the river of life, the Holy Spirit was there all along, hidden realities in the middle of the garden. God always had a plan. Jesus was there all along. Adam took from the tree of life. Jesus put himself on the tree of life and let us take from him to eat. Both Adams will battle Satan, but the new Adam is victorious. The new Adam will save the old Adam. This is the harrowing of Hades. It's on Holy Saturday when Jesus breaks the bondage. He has crushed the head of Satan. Everyone thinks he's over. He's in the tomb. Everyone has gone away. It's a quiet day. That's the day he descends to Hades and frees all the imprisoned spirits. He came to set all the captives free. The last two he pulls out are Adam and Eve. It's a free gift. It's not like the trespass. For if the many died through the one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift and the grace in one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. And the free gift is not like the effect of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. That's what we celebrate on Easter Vigil Night This is the night. You know how beautiful that night is in our church. This is the night when Adam was freed. The Easter proclamation, the exultant says this. I love this prayer in the exultant. Lord Jesus, our Lord, his son, his only begotten, who for our sake paid Adam's debt to the eternal father. And pouring out his own dear blood, wiped clean the record of our ancient sinfulness. Oh, truly necessary sin of Adam. Truly necessary. Destroyed completely by the death of Christ. Oh, happy fault of Adam that earned for us so great a glorious Redeemer. Had Adam not fallen, we wouldn't have met Jesus. O oh, truly blessed night, worthy alone to know the time and hour when Christ rose from the underworld. He freed all the imprisoned spirits, made a gateway and access back to the Father by a free gift of grace. This is the night of which it is written, the night shall be as bright as day. Dazzling is the night for me and full of gladness. That same transfigured Lord, that brightness of light. That same bright light that Paul saw on the road to Damascus, the risen Christ, the blinding light has come. 
The sanctifying power of this night dispels wickedness, washes faults away, restores innocence to the fallen, and joy to mourners, drives out hatred, fosters concord, and brings down the mighty. This is the night. It's because of one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one. Much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Some people think that baptism is like a washing machine. The little ditty, baptism, baptism is like a washing machine. You go in dirty, but you come out clean. Kind of, but not quite. What then are we to say? Should we continue to sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? A little different than a washing machine. You're baptized into his death. So that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly be reunited with him in a resurrection like his. And that's why we have hope. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is free from sin. You died in your baptism. You were full of the Holy Spirit. You have the grace needed to live by the Spirit, to walk with the Spirit. So we take that baby for death. You put it in the cute little dress and took it to die, (laughs) to drown sin, so that that baby can rise from the dead. And that baby did nothing. It was a free gift, all right, because that baby just lied there. But you as a parent promised You promised on your wedding day, if you got married in a Catholic sacramental wedding, you promised to raise your children in the faith. And when you took them for baptism, you claimed them for Christ, and you promised to raise them in the faith. And you chose godparents, not because they would give really great gifts, but because they would help you raise that child in the faith. That's what you promised God in that sacrament. And he has showered you with the grace to do that. If you avail yourself to that grace... If we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. There's no avoiding the cross of Christ. It's the only way home. There will be suffering. If you do not take up the cross and follow me, you're not worthy of me, said Jesus. If you want to be my follower, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. He called the crowd and said to his disciples, if any want to become my followers, deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. And I love Luke because he says, take up your cross daily, every single day, that endurance, pick it up and follow me and be led by the spirit. You will be children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact you suffer with him so that you can be glorified with him, there's no avoiding the cross of Christ. None of us is getting out of here alive, but filled with the Spirit, we can do it. He promises. He promises. Do you want to be a sin, a slave to death, or a slave to God, a slave to the Spirit? It's a free gift of life. He's told us since the beginning of the Bible, choose life and live. Choose life. My last thought, Moses in the Exodus, he's taking the people through the Red Sea. They've been in slavery, in bondage for 400 years, over 400 years. God's going to recreate this people. What will he use? Thank you. He'll always use water and spirit. So they're going through the water of death. That could cave in at any minute, and they could all die. They're going through the water of death, and there's the cloud of the spirit. Water and spirit, and they're going to the promised land. And when it's night, it's a pillar of fire. And they're going through water with the help of the Spirit. But Pharaoh's men are just going through water. They don't believe in the Spirit of the living God. They're just going through waters of death. And they're going to die. They're going to get drowned because the waters are going to come in on them. They don't believe in the Spirit of the living God after all ten plagues, after every chance. They don't believe. They don't have the Spirit. Moses' people is led by the Spirit. How many of Moses' generation get to the promised land? 
Out of all those hundreds and hundreds and thousands of Israelites, only two. Joshua and Caleb are the only two that make it to the promised land, and they all had water and spirit. What happened? They didn't live by the spirit. They didn't walk with the spirit. They grumble, 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 grumble. Is this all you got to eat? He gives them the bread of angels. Is this it? We wanted leeks and garlic like in Egypt. We're tired of this. <laughs> the Israelites were ruled by the flesh, carnal pleasure. We want more. Intercourse with our husband and wife. Are you kidding me? Let's have orgy. Let's build a golden calf. Let's party. Moses is gone. They're not living by the spirit because the Holy Spirit didn't indwell them yet. But now the Spirit indwells us. Last slide. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God and who are called for his purpose. I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Oh, Lord, nothing can separate us from your love. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Please help us fight concupiscence. Help us live by the Spirit and walk with the Spirit. Please give us an outpouring and an infilling of your Holy Spirit to go out this week to be Christ to others, our families, our neighbors, our community. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you. All honor, glory, and praise to you, Father through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Paul Miki, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.